Welcome to the one within all. You're tuned to the Innerverse, a podcast about everything, but especially dedicated to the expansion of our collective connection to the foundational force of the universe, which is the imagination. This is truly an auspicious moment in time as we are not only on the bleeding edge of a fantastically complex present moment, but have also reached the 100th episode of the show. It's been an amazing journey of self-discovery to record conversations like the one we're about to start with the polymath artist and singularity rewilder himself, Michael Garfield. It's a perfect convergence to be having Michael on the 100th show because he's such a free-thinking and infinitely expanding expression of the human life fractal that his collected works probably touch on just about every subject we've ever covered on this podcast and more. As a paleontologist, futurist, Performing musician and live artist, you'd think Michael was already doing enough awesome stuff, but somehow he also creates one of the most fascinating podcasts on the planet called Future Fossils, where he speaks to radically intelligent and innovative creators about the features of our present moment and our destiny as future ancestors. This seems like a good time to let you know that if you like this chat and you find yourself wanting more, there's a second hour you can access at patreon.com forward slash interverse. Subscribe to Plus, and you'll be helping me make my transition from part-time artist to full-time freelance creator. And I like to think that the extended episodes really make it worth your while, because I have a hard time even cutting out the content from the free show, because I want you to have it so badly, because it's, it's neato. But I have to have some kind of way to create a reciprocal relationship between us, and this is currently the best model I can conceive. However, imagination willing, there will be many new paths to serendipitous connections for us in the future. So as we're getting started, remember you can check the show notes for a link to my Patreon. You'll also find a plethora of links to Michael's creative outlets online, like the music that you're hearing in the background here, which is totally improvised by the way. I implore you to show Michael some love online, or give him a hug in person if you ever meet him. And subscribe to his Patreon, too, if you want to support his super heroic expressions of creative consciousness. Now, dear listeners, let's tap into the singularity within and ping Michael's mental IP frequency with an appreciative psychic welcome strong enough to make him feel a little tingly. Thanks for coming on the show, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, Chance, that's uh, it's funny you're talking about heroic, and I just my mind just naturally goes to Terrence McKenna's heroic dose, you know, and, and the thought that, uh, my friend Mitch Mignano told me once that I just publish an avalanche of content. And I was like, you know, maybe it is, maybe, maybe there's, there's gotta be a better way to like allow people to microdose on me. (laughs) <laughs> you know medium is actually kind of good for that if you guys check out his writing over on medium.com which will be linked in the notes you can one thing that's nice about it is it tells you you're getting a five minute dose or a 17 minute dose like how many grams is this psychedelic experience you're about to read yeah fair enough so this is cool i'm glad to be 100 that's that's honor of some kind <laughs> yeah it it's been a very interesting week preparing for this because like I said, I've pretty much now dove in through your stuff into every aspect of what I usually cover on the podcast. We have a lot of live artists actually in the audience. And I guess maybe if you want, we can open up with talking about your experiences in that dimension. And if you have any uh, words on how to have a better time doing it, then I would, I bet people would love to hear it. Yeah. Well, uh, hello artists. I love you. And I, I rarely think of myself as a member of a group, but I, I always feel sort of more at home with my life painter friends than I do in almost anything else, which is, is, uh, I don't know. It has something to do with there not really being a place for us. I guess, you know, that, that, that we are still sort of in that cowboy cowgirl kind of zone, um, to use the, the word from weird studies. Like they, they talk about this, uh, on episode 14 and 15 of that podcast, which I have been binge listening to 
uh, recently, Phil Ford and J.F. Martel's Weird Studies. And, and they're talking about uh, Taratovsky's film Stalker, how it relates to Jeff Vandermeer's uh, Annihilation, both of which feature this anomalous zone, which, you know, is like uh, Hakim Bey talking about the temporary autonomous zone where, you know, like a pirate utopia where the rules don't really apply and, and it's a liminal space. You know, Eric Davis is, is fond of talking about festivals as liminal spaces where you aren't going into it with the same assumptions about your life. Like you're not, um, you're not bringing necessarily the same you into those spaces that you would ordinarily bring into a room. And there's more of an opportunity for self-discovery or for self-reinvention. And then even within those spaces, uh, within, you know, the sort of ecology of a festival, I, th I still think even if they're on the flyer, that artists, uh, paint, like visual artists occupy a, a kind of liminal zone within the liminal zone where, you know, uh, people either think that you shouldn't be there because you're getting in the way uh, or they think that you're getting paid, but you're not, or, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. It's like, you know, um, I've had every kind of experience as a live painter from having to basically uh, fight the venue when the band wants me there, you know, to like really struggle to be allowed into, into a space uh, or, you know, you're on stage and nobody knows who you are, <laughs> you know, like you're there up there with every, all of these famous people and you're just like this random nobody making a painting, which, you know, leads to uh, a lot of people feeling like they can just sort of uh, appoint themselves to take up this career. And, and so unlike the sort of uh, more established boundary between the artist and the audience that you get with a DJ, you know, um, or, you know, any kind of musical act on stage, there is this I think I feel like the artists occupy this spot in between audience and and uh, mystical creator. You know that you can walk up to Randall Roberts and Morgan Mandela and talk to them and like you know get a hug and share a beer. Um, and so there's a human and relatable element to this innately weird thing. And I think that that's I don't know, I don't know why I'm ranting about this, but. Uh, I love you because you're willing to stand in the discomfort uh, in, and, and to pour your love and energy into something where uh, there are no like simple, clearly defined roles or responsibilities. And uh, it really is so much more than in most things about how you bring yourself into that experience in that moment it kind of makes it what it is. Yeah, my actual first experience with a festival involved at a certain point during maybe the most wild part for me, I came up with this weird mask out of just like found objects that basically was just a very strange and unique guise that I created. And I walked around all night doing quests for people and like just being a different person to each person I met and realizing <laughs> that when nobody knows who you are, you are also not limited by your expectation or their expectation of who you think that you should be. And that is one of the things that is in biggest disharmony with our culture right now is that some of us are, you know, party getting to have a more party and easygoing lifestyle. And the other people are definitely not as free to choose as many avenues of the life expression that, you know, they would like to. In your article called Transformational Festivals Are a Symptom of Dissociation, you kind of bring this up. And it's something that, like, for the experience I was referring to my first time at a festival, I never would have been thinking this way at all. I was so far out away from very deep self-reflection about my connection to the outside world as an expression of psyche. But you, you quote in this article, or to quote you in this article, kind of a long quote, but I think it's worth it. 
the very fact that we see festivals as an escape or as a peak experience points to how severely dissociated we are from ourselves. We don't pay what it actually costs for a meal or a gallon of gasoline if we were to quantify all of the services that our ecosystems provide to the economy. We ignore the suffering of migrant workers, offshore sweatshops, factory farm animals, and even domestic cubicle zombies upon which the entire house of cards is perched. To me, the reason we find ourselves in this severe planetary disequilibrium stems from the difference between our mental and physical bodies. In material existence, we face hardships and impediments to our will, but in the mindscape, we're potentially free and limitless, and we're able to instantly imagine or think anything. One result of our evolution to be proficient inventors is that we've gradually gone about smoothing over as many of the bumps and hurdles of the natural world as we can to make the body's experience more in line with the mind's freedom. But as you pointed out in that quote from your article, even the most benignly minded cultures like Festi people still have a disharmonic consequence to their behavior, even if it's really far removed from us physically. So I know you talk about this a lot, but how, how do you imagine we can bridge the gap between the creation of euphoric life experiences for ourselves and consciousness of our global ecosystem as a whole? Well, okay, so my father worked in uh, travel for 40 years in the travel industry. And there's a big piece of my own participation with the world of entertainment and of festivals as a sort of sins of the fathers kind of thing that I'm trying to like work out and get right, you know, like to understand, uh, you know, like just to look at the difference between Disneyland and Burning Man, for example, like Disneyland never really cared about what happens when you go home from Disneyland, except insofar as that they hope that you continue to buy Disney merchandise. And Burning Man, even though it's largely a hypocritical conversation, I mean, it's Burning Man is not one sort of identity. And it's at, it, like a real community, like a real city, it's at odds with itself. And that in that tension lies its sort of creative potential. Um, but you much more at Burning Man, you hear these conversations, and it's definitely a script pushed by the organization itself about bringing these kinds of ideas and this kind of thinking into our lives, into the rest of our, our year, you know, cause I think it's, it's uh, pretty common these days. We've been thinking in terms of the, the annual ring, you know, the seasonal round uh, for thousands of years at this point, the year is like a useful way to think about it. Now, what are you going to do with the other 51 weeks a year? And, you know, so much of what you, quoted from that essay uh, that, you know, the hidden true cost of our lives is about the distance that the hamburgers, various components have to travel to get to you. Um, you know, that, that, that stuff is all managed by this enormous corporation or, or like network of corporations that are all able to subsidize or like externalize various costs and then, you know, pass a discount down. Whereas we're in the weird situation now where if you get the same ingredients locally, you're going to pay more for it because you don't have this, this monster institution absorbing, you know, tiny little costs everywhere. I guess what I'm saying is, is that, um, the issue of like how how dissociated we are and how much the festivals reveal this, it's not like it's the festival's fault. It's that the festival is one additional example of how these things that in any healthy human community we would find at home, we have to like travel across the country to get to them now. So, you know, you are the hamburger ingredient that's having to you know, get on a semi truck and, and, you know, cruise 700 miles down I-70 to whatever. This doesn't make any sense, obviously. I mean, there obviously lots of animals migrate, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed at all to global commerce on one level, but we have put ourselves in this position now where 
the kind of community and solidarity and emotional support, like the touch. Let's make it real simple. Most people living in our culture are deprived of non-sexual touch, right? And when you go to a festival and you hang out in a cuddle puddle with your friends and you're like, that's the most wonderful thing ever. Most people, you know, are, are sort of enculturated to think, oh, well, I need to go back and, and have some more of that. You know, I need to go back to that festival next year. It was so wonderful. Rather than why in the hell am I sitting alone in this wood and drywall box all the time instead of surrounding myself with the things that matter to me, really, that make me feel good? You know, why, why am I not the, you know, the celebration at its, you know, sort of at its most distilled thing, that essay is about how celebration is supposed to be a part of our daily lives. You know, that, that one in four days in the old Christian calendar was a feast day, you know, and the way that we have in the modern world tried to like compartmentalize everything and differentiate it so that your business is over here and your neighborhood is over here. You know, even though like the zoning of our cities is insane. You know, it, you really, it feels good to live in a walkable neighborhood where people live and work within walking distance of each other. We know that walking around prevents senile dementia, that, that people stay older, uh, that they stay healthy and smart and capable of taking care of themselves much longer if they're able to walk around a neighborhood because your legs and your brain are connected. My only healthy grandparent walks a shitload. He has like a bunch of t-shirts. There are awards for how many miles he's walked at a local fitness center. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, these little things, it's like, um, we've put up all of these crutches, like this, the back of this chair that I'm leaning on, but leaning on the back of this chair is, is externalizing the cost of me having to sit up straight to the older version of me with back problems. You know, like, and it, you see the same thing everywhere. We're living in food deserts, unless you're in Portland, you know, or like a couple neighborhoods in, you know, Southern LA where you know, people took the initiative to plant gorilla gardens in the easement next to the sidewalk. You know, like we're, we, I guess basically all I'm saying is that you start in the middle and work out. And that, re- that, that means that it requires a lot of remedial work on everyone's part to first identify what we need and second disabuse ourselves of the notion that it's supposed to be supplied to us by like a utility by some invisible third party that doesn't live anywhere near us you know these food water uh, meaning, you know, I put religious ritual and, you know, festival celebration in that, you know, these are basic things. And if we can't find them in our community, we're going to find them somewhere. Only they're not going to be as nutritious for us, you know, like, I, I mean, I am not a great example of somebody who goes to the effort of locally sourcing or growing my food, but I can tell the difference you know, and I know, I know that I would be a happier person if I were eating more of the food that I had grown myself. And there's something, you know, there's something exactly that going on with this sense of divorce from the basic things that make human life worth living and like identifying how to generate our own sense of meaning and purpose. So. Yeah, I don't know. Feel f- by the way, we're in we're having a conversation, right? So you can just yeah. cut me off. I really like it. <laughs> okay, uh, I might jump in a little more as we go on. I have plenty of questions for sure, but you kind of j- just follow my train of thought as I sit and listen to you. So it's cool with me as much as you want to tirade about any subject. I have another quote for you. It's kind of on topic here, especially relating to you know transforming those empty lots into permaculture and creating our own meaning instead of buying it prepackaged. But uh, to quote the physicist David Bohm, in nature, nothing remains constant. Everything is in a perpetual state of transformation and change. 
However, we discover that nothing simply surges up out of nothing without having antecedents that existed before. Likewise, nothing ever disappears without a trace in the sense that it gives rise to absolutely nothing existing at later times. Everything comes from other things and gives rise to other things. And so what we see is evolution tends to repurpose adaptations for previously unforeseen innovation, just like in the most recent episode of Future Fossils, where you were talking to the Eggleston, I think was his name. James Eggleston, yeah. Eggleston, yeah. He was really fired up about uh, decentralizing the power grid. And that's something that I definitely see the value in. You even brought up how solar costs have come down. I was able to implement solar where I live for only, a, you know, only one arm instead of two. But I guess my question is uh, how... How, how uh, do modern aspects of technology and infrastructure have the potential to be pushed beyond their original intent? And how does that also, how do you apply that concept to developing as an artist in the, you know, creating meaning? Oh, wow. Okay. So this, this is about, you know, everything being evolved for some other thing originally, right? Like the context in which the leg appears is not actually really at the boundary between the water and the land it's it's in the water and so then you find out later oh shit this works really well for you know dragging myself around looking at modern infrastructure in this way i don't know you know i think i'm i mean that's part of the the question right is how do we get outside of the ways that we're used to looking at things, you know, like all, all innovation is about seeing what already is with fresh eyes. So, I mean, certainly, you know, I can point to projects that I think are really inspiring in this regard, you know, any, any of the number of, of projects that are looking to create a distributed computing platforms where everyone's, everyone's got devices that's just they're just hanging out online not really doing anything but if we could weave those together in a way so that we can use all of that un unspent computing power to work on a big problem you know while you're asleep you know and you're willing to donate or or sell that that uh drive space or that ram um, you know, something similar like that, uh, James Eggleston was talking about in terms of, the, you know, the people who can produce more electricity than they need, just being able to sell it into the, into the grid around them and like sell it to, to, uh, their neighbors. And I think that that kind of thing is a, a major trend right now, because we're realizing that we, you know, Doug Rushkoff talks about this a lot about, how when he was growing up, maybe only one person on the whole block would have a barbecue, you know? And so everybody would get back, to, you know, everyone would go grill over at this person's place. And that was actually encouraging of community, but that we've been taught, you know, over your life and my whole life that, oh, everyone needs their own because you're going to want yours to have slightly different features. You know, it's, it's all of that, that uh, century of the self stuff and the planned obsolescence cycles that keep us coming back for more to keep up with each other to the point where there's not such a thing as keeping up with the joneses anymore it's keeping up with the world yeah yeah that's a good point the superstar effect you know this notion that it's yeah it's not just having the best you know it's not just being the best actor in your city anymore you know you have to compete with whoever hollywood is throwing up into the into the the cinemaplex you know, and that's that where that notion comes from is from the death of local theater. You know, we we sort of have this this idea of the magic of of cinema, um, but that was absolutely like projected into us. You know, and 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 the reality is that that Hollywood did to local theater what Amazon did to local bookstores, and it's not it's not really pretty. Um, no, it's not. People that I know that are actors have a, the hardest time uh, trying to make a living off of that, especially anywhere outside of that, you know, dark imperial nexus called Hollywood. <laughs> you know, local, you're right, local, even though they could be fantastic. I, I like to go see local plays and performances and they're always such a small audience. And 
it makes it so not cool and intimate and it's like there's just way more emotional flow between the audience and what's happening. It's not that I don't enjoy a good movie. Of course, that medium deserves its place as well. But even small time filmmakers don't make it onto the the big screen either. So like not just local theater, but we luckily have the Internet now to help decentralize that whole media pushing thing that's going on and as much as they the you know the powers that shouldn't be do fight to keep the throttle on anything other than what's been stamped with their approval or generated by them it things are definitely getting out of the box like you know the fact that you are doing so many eclectic things and people can know you for all of it that's that's just um, a hallmark of this present moment that makes th- that's very unique so as we're like basically shifting grounds of our entire society between a centralized platform and external authority and external God, uh, all of that to a more internal and decentralized mode. And what we're talking about makes me think about your poem, Archaeopteryx, a bird's eye view of groundedness. I had to look up how to read, oh, no. I had to look up how to, how to pronounce, pronounce that dinosaur name, but you're talking about in that poem the point in planetary evolution when life realized it could learn to fly and shift from one ground to another, which is a similar nested, you know, nested singularity in a way to what we're facing right now with trying to decentralize. Being grounded itself has a multiplicity of meanings that we could explore, but I wanted to ask you about philosophical and ontological grounds, how every cosmological perspective requires a foundational notion to be believed whether it's a big bang just suddenly deciding to happen or the idea that everything is and always has been. The philosophical term unground is what you might use to describe the void beyond our preferred perspective or simply the unknown. So my question is, what is the chosen ground for your worldview right now? And can you speculate what's beyond its veil? Mm. Uh, Well, I try not to rely on a ground good answer i mean i I mean i don't know that i mean there is a sense yeah there is a sense in which every every point of view requires a place to stand right um and i'm not i'm not gonna be like pretentious and claim that i'm not standing on you know and they're like or reliant on a lot of assumptions and a lot of support. Literally standing on mountains of bones of our ancestors, as you say. Yeah, but but uh, especially down here in in uh, in Texas, because we're you know we're in the the intercontinental seaway. It's all limestone, you know. So that's not not my ancestors, but you know, um, my antecedents. Anyway, um, but then again, like you look to people like Richard Doyle, who's one of my favorite writers um, and his mentor, Gary Weber, and they're standing in this tradition of like Advaita Vedanta non-dual philosophy, which is fierce and unrelenting in its interrogation of what we think we know. And that, you know, unrelenting in its reminder to turn awareness back on these things that we take for granted, namely the, this concept of a self. And then that concept contains all of the things that you believe, you know, all of the, the sort of strategies that, how do I, I mean, how do I put this? It's like, it's a filter, right? And so I think the most honest thing that we can do is strip that filter as best we can. You know, that there's that uh, g- with great enlightenment or is it, sorry, it's, it's with great doubt comes great enlightenment. Like great enlightenment requires great doubt. And there is a sense in a daily life where in my daily life, yeah, I'm making all kinds of assumptions. You know, I'm making the assumptions that, that I'm going to live to a certain rough age, you know, that I'm going to have to work a certain amount in order to afford a certain lifestyle that, you know, that I probably, you know, should 
let go of certain things by this age and pick up certain habits by this age. But as part of an, a, a commitment to truth, then all of that scheming is just scheming, right? And I, I mean, it's, it, these are hypotheses. And if, if you were to like think about it in like a, a, I guess, in the language of the scientific process, you get like, you have an observation and then you come up with a hypothesis about it and then you test that hypothesis. And then testing that hypothesis, you have another observation. And it's like, I think, you know, this notion that we have a, a narrative, you know, or a framing story for our lives that's a reflex or a habit that is something that we do but it's not i'm not convinced that it's something that we have to do necessarily or you know like gary weber says that he only experiences a self when he's got really low blood sugar which i really like you know that he's like so that he's far enough advanced in his meditation practice that it's like it's not like he crossed some you know, some bridge and then burned it down behind him. It's just that, you know, there, these things come and go. And you, when you're absorbed in a, you know, a flow state, you know, when you're really giving yourself to whatever it is that you're doing, then a lot of these other questions become deeply irrelevant because you're not, actually yeah you you don't have the brain resources to even entertain them you know to really give yourself over entirely to your life means i think sort of jettisoning the project of trying to make some sort of final sense of it i don't know if i'm even answering your question i think that you are answering the question because we're basically just talking about the unknown so like what can you say about the unknown <laughs> but the notion that we are going to make some kind of movement in the future or something is going to happen or change based on our intention that is seemingly programmed into nature. You know, what made the first sea creature cross the threshold onto land? It was some kind of a, a notion that I'm going to go over there now and a bit of or, discomfort, <laughs> discomfort, but that is kind of what drives most of our ego choices as well, or Discomfort with our our still quiet self is what makes us dream that we need to achieve X, Y, or Z in order to feel fulfilled. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, insofar as what it is that comes next, um, more unknown, like not just unknown, like you talk about like cardinality in math, in math, where it's like, you're not just talking about infinity, but you're talking about infinity plus infinity, you know? So there's, there's a mathematics has come up with a way to handle that. So it's not just the unknown, you know, this is a fixed quantity. Um, but that you can have, uh, you know, more and more of our lives becomes weird and mysterious and strange and unpredictable. You know, the, uh, Nassim Taleb talks about the black swan, this, like this, uh, unpredicted risk you know, this, this potentially catastrophic event that nobody saw coming and you get into this weird sort of, uh, Zen koan with how the one thing we can kind of guarantee is that as we get better with our tools of prediction, that the unpredictable will grow in, in the mirror, you know, that, that it, it will, it will take over more and more of our thought and our activity um, because it, you know, it becomes more and more obvious where the, the gaps are in our knowing. And so, you know, what are we headed into? I think, uh, I think we're headed into a world where acceptance and embrace and like celebration of the weird or the mysterious is more and more commonplace. And, and to give a shout out to uh, weird studies podcast again, there's, they have episode four. I think they talked to Eric Davis about 
how it's already the case that it, things are trending this way, that if you look at the world we live in compared to the world that those hosts and that guest grew up in, you know, and they're only like 10, 15 years older than we are. But a lot of the stuff that's commonplace now was like the marginalized nerd culture back in the 80s, you know, that that there weren't enormous comic con conventions and cosplay and like, you know, there that there were not m massive, highly well-produced television shows about magic and, and like stuff like that, like that there is that every revolution brings the margin into the center and the margin. So this is like a phenomenal thing. I mean, this is, I mean, like a phenomenological thing that, that uh, sort of what lies at the edge of the self is the weird and beyond that, the fully unknown. And that it's like that, um, that egg thing at the end of annihilation that's constantly opening out of itself and how, you know, as the, as the, I don't know, or maybe it's like a volcano is, a, is like an easier metaphor where it's like, as this stuff erupts up out of the volcano, that what was, what was at the edge is now in the, the middle and that, you know, the, the stuff gets pushed around. And, and so as we move into, you know, as we move deeper into this, that, I think future generations will sort of take for granted and be and consider totally mundane things that we find extremely bizarre, possibly even unthinkably bizarre. Like I had John Peterson on the show and on Future Fossils, and he he's a futurist who has done a lot of work with you know, like the White House and the military and like really serious clients. And when I asked him to freewheel about what he thought the next sort of paradigm shift would be, he started talking about like genies and, you know, stuff that is like really only acceptable to discuss if you're, if you're like so deep in the new age that most people think that your brain has fallen out, you know? And he, and he's saying, right. he's like, uh, uh, what we're going to find is that like the next period of, of human civilization is going to be one that's totally at peace with the idea of discarnate entities that are like influencing the scene of human affairs from backstage. And that there's like, you know, that world leaders are actually making like appeals to these, these beings, you know, that are trying to like curry their favor and that this has actually been going on forever. And that it's, it's much like the, the externalized cost of the hamburger you know, that there's something, we're not getting the whole story here. And that, you know, the whole story is that meaning is not located in the head, that we've, that we've pushed the, the weird. This is, and th this sort of ties into philosopher Timothy Morton and, and his book, Hyper Objects, where he talks about, you know, we think of the inanimate, the alien sort of reality of the non-living world as like out there and I'm alive. But in our contemplation of, the, of stuff like radiation and global warming that requires us to think on such enormous space-time scales and to recognize that these, these vast weird things uh, that we're inside of them and that we're made out of them, that it becomes impossible to honest, to like truthfully deny that we are every, that, that the person you, you think you are is every bit as alien and and bizarre and unknowable as the most alien bizarre unknowable thing that you can come up with absolutely your physical literally your body itself not just like the the identity that you have mentally constructed out of language but just literally the body that you are in contains the entire mystery of the whole rest of the cosmos as the ancients said and like as it was inscribed over the i think oracle at delphi in ancient greece Know thyself and you shall know the universe and the gods. And what is interesting is that we're moving into a time where instead of being trapped in the polarization between it's all matter or it's all spirit and matter is to be degraded. As the great William Blake said, we can now realize man has no body distinct from his soul for that called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses. 
the notion that man has a body distinct from his soul is to be expunged. I like that. And uh, what do you th- what do you think we have to gain by reclaiming that quintessential connection to the source, shadow, and all? Well, f- for starters, it's going to allow us to properly grieve what we need to grieve in order to move forward together. Like in order in order to move forward with wholeness, I guess. You know that there's that we've we have done so much harm historically speaking and not just white guys but like every culture at some point or another has committed some horrible atrocity that they didn't understand at the time you know and you know i was just at the interplanetary festival in santa fe and they were talking about how it's okay to bring i forget who it was i think it was neil stevenson talking about this he said it's it's okay for us to bring back the word colonization as we move out into space because it means something different because we're not going to be appropriating the homeland of some intelligent race of people like we're we're you know we're going to be going and like making settlements in in places where there was no life and now there is and I, and I thought Yeah, but, you know, they didn't really think of them as people in the 15th and 16th centuries either. Yeah, what about these disincarnate entities? There might be things there we can't see. Yeah, God only knows. Like when when, um, Daniel Rosenberg, Dada Ra, was on Future Fossils, we talked about this with respect to virtual reality. And it's like, is virtual reality like a military industrial colony taking root in the imagination? And... If so, then what does like throwing up this clapboard frontier town in that sort of like rich hyperspace really do? Like what is the real cost of replacing your own like endless uh, faculty, your your, like endlessly deep, rich wealth of closed eye imagery and then just like, slapping some music on there you know instead and then they just i don't know i just again i mean that's sort of verging on um the intolerable for a modern person to accept the possibility that there may be you know that in 400 years that we're going to recognize some kind of agency or moral claim on the part of a what we think of as a dead world like Mars, you know that that Mars that we may look back on on that with the same sort of horror that we look back on you know what we did to the Native Americans, you know. Um, but you know that that's file file under uh, what my buddy Andrew Giesel used to talk about in in college as like the debate will not will one day not be between omnivores and and vegetarians, but between people that ate something that was alive, whether or not it had a brain, and people who were willing to synthesize their food out of sand with nanotechnology. But then even what if we then find out later down this line that each granule of sand was itself containing multiple universes and <laughs> there's nothing that you could do about that process of obliteration. I mean, life eats life. Damn That's, it. I, I'm, this is coming from someone that is a, a vegetarian, basically a, a vegan other than I get eggs from someone I know is pretty nice to the ducks. But you know, that doesn't take me away from the realization that my cats need to eat meat or they're not going to do well. Uh, it's just a, like it's just a matter of harm reduction at, at this point to be even considering a vegetarian lifestyle because of the biodiversity that's lost by continuing to expand the, the cattle grazing operations and the potential for actual psychological harm to the entire consciousness fractal through the suffering that is done unto the two factory farmed animals. It, that's something that's unmeasured as of yet, maybe will never be quite measurable, but on maybe a psychological side, you could look at somebody who wouldn't be able to pull the trigger to slaughter the animal themselves, outsourcing that to somebody else who would as being kind of like that is a way of going against their inner 
child or their inner true being or whatever you want to call it because they it's not an action that they would perform so to just disassociate from it kind of like we were talking about before could be detrimental but to go back to the virtual reality thing i have kind of thought with this new frontier of insanely fast computers ridiculous graphics cards and all this processing power being put to work for things like mining bitcoin with all that capacity to generate and create these artistic and beautiful worlds, you might imagine that consciousness could possibly exist in all forms of energy or at least sentience of some capacity. And perhaps the higher level, some Buddhists have said too, that it's possible that the higher level of complexity in a system combined with energy could lead to forms of self-reflective consciousness like what we experience. So it makes me wonder when we're looking at these super hyped uh, super duper fast computers that are doing these bitcoin mining operations what if in the chassis of those computers they are imagining and creating entire worlds that they are essentially the god of or the host consciousness that everything is in and they create sub automata sub beings that are autonomous but able to do the mining operation for them so that they're free to think and imagine and construct worlds with all that extra processing power and those created artificial beings in the computer system because they're interfacing with all the energy that's going through that system in a symbol based and narratively constructed form because the computer gave them the meaning then they don't know the difference between the artificial world they're in and the true reality outside of it and to me you know just the simulation theory question makes most sense to say it's all nested levels of simulations within simulations in a way in in minds of one form of architecture be it physical or digital all this is all fractally representing the same type of hyper connectivity of all energy we're definitely getting into uh rick and morty zone here dimension c137 um love that well i mean the thought that i i i Okay, I want to, while totally honoring the simulation thing, which I'm quite fond of. Um, For me, it's just speculation, not necessarily a stance. Yeah, yeah, but like, I mean, I'm a Copernicus kind of guy when it comes to, you know, I'm. I think that this the my native disposition, maybe looping back to your earlier question about, you know, what 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 sort of ground am I standing on? I think my, one of my sort of orienting assumptions is that if you think we're special in some way or that our location is special in some way, uh, we're probably wrong. You know, like if we think we're in the center of something, we're probably wrong. You know, if we think we're the first, we're probably wrong. And I find this, this coming out, um, through, pretty much all of my other, you know, stoner philosophy armchair beliefs, such as that we're not even the first global civilization, you know, that there was a, a, a probably very primitive, but nonetheless, planet circling maritime civilization. Uh, this is the, you know, the Graham Hancock, uh, magicians of the gods sort of thesis that was wiped out by a comet 13,000 years ago. And that, that's why there's this sudden and, and actually really sort of traumatic leap between hunter gatherers in the archeological record. And what we understand is like a Western uh, agriculture because it was, it, these people didn't actually come up with the agriculture themselves. They were, they were given agriculture by the survivors of the first civilization, you know? And so they, they didn't, they didn't have this sort of like natural segue into a healthy deployment of those ideas that you see with wild crafting agricultural traditions like in the Amazon and in um, ancient Australia, you know, where these, it wasn't just like massive irrigated farms, but at any rate, so that's, that's like, you know, Oh, you think you're the first wrong, you know, it's like finding out your parents, you know, had a kid before you, that they put up for adoption or something like that kind of stuff happens all the time. So I generally think that, you know, that's, or we find out that a Raven is capable of solving a seven step puzzle, you know, and that dolphins refer to each other by name. It's like, all right, all right. Well, you know, there's, 
what makes us special is like a combination of otherwise unspecial parts. It's not like we have some unique thing. So on that level, great. Everything's a uh, remix. Yeah, everything's a remix. But um, to the the question of like, do do I think that, I used to wonder if Google was like, you know, become super conscious without us even realizing it. And I think now that there's this really solid, this integrated information theory, right? Which is the idea that consciousness exists as, it's not an increase in the amount of information of a system exactly. It's, it's just a measure of how integrated the various parts of that system are. Um, and so, you know, something that has a, you know, most of its, like an octopus has most of its brain and its limbs, right? So it's got a very diffuse sort of different experience than something with most of its nerve tissue on one end of the body. And then, then you know, this, this notion that you could have uh, interiority, mind, awareness, a form of consciousness without being self-aware. And that what most people think of as, as consciousness is like really like self-awareness, the ability to reflect on identity. And you would, you would expect to see certain kinds of feedback loops going on in the architecture of that kind of a, a creature. And so I don't, I don't know if Bitcoin miners have that architecture. Uh, I, I doubt that they do, um, because there, there there has to be like like I haven't read this book, but I know that um, Douglas Hofstadter talks about this. And I am a strange loop, you know that this this recursive thing about consciousness. So you can have, in some sense, you get like sentient atoms in a world, but that doesn't mean that they're conscious in the way that we kind of throw that word around on a daily basis. It means that they are, they are experiencing something, but it, but it means also that we are able to make an important differentiation between the kind of experience that a rock has and the kind of experience that a chihuahua has and the kind of experience that, you know, a, um, I did read a, I, I read an article a few years ago that they, they said that there was a, they'd managed to program a robot to recognize itself in the mirror seven times out of 10. And it's like, that was, be, that was like before alpha go. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there actually are self-aware robots at this point, or if there aren't, you know, like even Ray Kurzweil said that he thought that, that the sun had some kind of mind because he's a reductionist and he's like, yeah, you know, mind is just a, you know, it's a, it's a sufficiently complex pattern of some kind. And uh, so he was like, yeah, the sun probably, the magnetic fields of the sun are probably complex enough for it to be supporting some kind of mental activity. Maybe the electrical magnetic, you know, dichotomy within a, a structure has something to do with generating and containing the consciousness, if consciousness is something pervasive, but it's sort of like a force that is drawn in, like a radio receiver picking it up, I could definitely see the sun or the entire solar system being uh, in some way communicating and interconnected. But yeah, what you're saying about not being sure what level of self-awareness a system or a creature might have, it, that is a big question. And I think the fact that we do kind of differentiate and create hierarchies about that is part of what allows us to do heinous things. And even in the past, our ancestors look at a, a less technologically advanced tribe as being heathens or subhuman. You know, it, at the end of the day, you can point at mo most animals having a form of emotional intelligence or feeling. And so at the very least, we could say there might be a feeling of what it's like to be a sun, if not a deep level of self-reflection. But I think with the sun, it stands to be very possible that there's a high degree of some form of intelligence that we're nested in it. The sun could be an artist that's creating the other planets like some sort of form of expression of its own potential. 
And even I found out recently from reading this interesting book about this very topic, about if the sun has consciousness potentially, uh, by, by Gregory Sams called Son of God. And he talks about all the religious and historical um, ancestor ideas about that versus in conjunction with his own personal experiences and then like NASA data. And one of the points he brought up was that NASA actually had found magnetic envelopes that every eight minutes or so connect the earth with sun and information uh, electrons travel back and forth through this like sort of like a download upload almost and of course it's, it's too immense for us to even decipher or decode what that information might be or at this point any form of purpose for it but it's interesting there's an interchange going on there and that similar to how you know blood flows through a brain potentially yeah well there's a you know john c wright science fiction author um who went from being an atheist to a born-again catholic in his 40s because he he can't he decided that the theologists were right and that you can't know for sure basically you that you cannot sort of deduce or or di uh, discover empirically the existence of an intelligence greater than your own because if it wants to hide from you it can because it's transcendentally smarter than you are you know so he's like so the whole the, the theological argument is that God can only be known from revelation, you know, that it, it cannot be, God can't be proven. Right. And it's not because God isn't an empirical uh, fact. It's that we're just too dumb. And so he, he, he was like, all right, God, as a hardcore rationalist skepticist, you know, uh, bring it on, like prove yourself to me. And then had, apparently the experience that he needed to have to convince him that this stuff that he had been uh, talking smack on militantly for his entire adult life was in fact the case. Um, but it's I think interesting, that this, my experience with like looking into non-local consciousness and entity contact and things of that nature makes me think there's a lot of potentially trickster type energies out there. So like you say, <laughs> bring it on. Well, Who's to say that that would I, – I personally would think that wouldn't be God because uh, – or I don't know. I, I don't like the external God thing at all, actually. I, I like the internal connection to the infinite more. And so I see anything that tries to like point to itself and say, I'm that. I'm the thing. Then that's probably something that wants you to send the attention energy to it of, yes, you are. You're the God. And in that sense, we might even be creating – are you familiar with the term tulpas? Oh, tulpa. yeah, yeah. Yeah. We could be creating tulpas out of all kinds of things besides just um, the planetary septenary that we used to have or, or the Jehovah God or the Jesus or the Buddha. Well, I mean, yeah. So maybe all he was doing was like flagging down the Catholic God who wants <laughs> to like, you know, slap its fat belly down like the like the demiurge and be like, oh, yeah, here, you know, here I am. Uh, and it's not this sort of ultimate source of all phenomena. But, you know, that's, that's like a, a 200 level conversation. Whereas I think as far as like his, <laughs> his uh, satisfaction at having been uh, convinced that there was some sort of transcendental intelligence that could reveal or hide itself at will, um, you know, I think that that's, then you can get into, okay, well, let, let's, let's, ex, let's explore the taxonomy of gods. And then there's like gods that like a challenge and then there's gods that are shy or whatever, you know, but yeah, I think you're, you're right. But Man, we've gone through so many topics, but we really didn't even touch on the music that you make or much on much on painting. I'm not sure what you'd like to, you know, point people towards as things to look for for Michael Garfield. But I, there's a lot I know. What, what are you most interested in that you're doing right now? The, I just published this thing uh, for free to Patreon uh, for everybody. Hold on, let me see if I can pull that up for you and you can post this in the show notes. Here's a link to all of the notes that I took um, 
on my iPad in uh, the Interplanetary Festival, like at, at this festival during panel discussions, as well as the 40 minute concert that I performed and some 360 videos. And I feel like that's, that's sort of in one package, I think that sort of brings it all together for people and makes it, you know, more than this, maybe this conversation has kind of brings the, the uh, spiritual quest and the scientific investigation and the creative exploration together in one place and like, you know, stacks them in an interesting way. And that's, that's my hope, you know, is right. You know, I want, I want that, like my old uh, teacher, Sean Hargens talks about head, heart and Hara, you know, living, you know, strongly anchored in all three energy centers of the body, you know? And so, yeah, if I can, if I can speak in a way that is like intuitively, like that's true to a person at the gut and true to the person in their heart and at least interesting, if not like, I'm not going to try and like, are, you know, persuade somebody that the way I see the world is true, but at least if I can get them to be curious about it, then that's a success. That's like, that's a, uh, you know, I've, I've covered the bases there. So I agree, man. Imagination is our natural, our most uh, precious natural resource, as you say, <laughs> that's what I want to do too, is fuel that. That's why I go so wild into the speculations on what might be possible <laughs> for humanity, even possibly to a reckless degree, <laughs> because I think that that's our biggest limitation is our, you know, our self image that we're only what we are right now. So, um, Man, it's been an awesome experience, though. You've definitely blown my mind. I know that's one of your stated objectives, is to blow minds. <laughs> I think I'm not the only one. And uh, I'll let you have the floor for as long as you'd like to wrap up any of the loose ends of our, our talk here. No, man, this has been great. Chance, I appreciate it. Um, thanks for having me on the show. Folks, if you like this, um, I've managed to drop Future Fossils podcast like a thousand times already so but you know go find it go listen to it and yeah just if you know if anything that i make the music or the writing or any of it is helpful to you or inspires you in some way then i would love to know um i would love to to uh meet you you know and because because otherwise i'm just sitting here in this like i said earlier i'm just sitting here in this freaking box all day yeah. you know like put like singing my song into the void you know like posting to facebook groups and whatever you know and it's so deeply rewarding to find out that that uh you've turned somebody on in some way it makes me feel like i'm i'm not wasting my time so I'll tell you, so thanks. I'm one of those minds that you've got uh, highly inspired by seeing what you do, especially in the not limiting myself. Just when I started listening to your music, whenever we got this on the schedule and I was just beginning to explore the Michael Garfield universe, that actually got me into picking up my guitar more than I have been. And yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and just uh, I found that it's amazing thing to be able to just fly, t jump into a flow state and if it's not one then another i love painting i love digital art i love making podcasts but like you said ultimately it's much more rewarding when we can connect with each other find out that we're inspiring each other and collaborate like this and not just be alone in the box <laughs> yeah man so thanks for being on i really appreciate the time for sure and I hope to talk again someday and definitely meet in meet space too before long. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a hug. <laughs> All right. I love hugs. Thanks, All right. Man. Cool. Thanks, man.
All of human history is just a hyphen connecting what was and what will be. If that's not a mind-bending statement, I don't know what is. But there was a lot of pretty fascinating stuff in this conversation, wasn't there? I know I, for one, barely got to talk about any of the ideas that Michael was making me have while we were talking because just like anything in life, whatever you get into keeps you from getting into other things. So my, hopefully I'll get to have him back on the show sometime and we can talk a little bit more about some of these topics. Like one thing I just kind of glazed over is the idea of a tulpa, which is when we're talking about kind of like gods and how there might be actual uh, some form of energy through attention that causes disincarnate beings to come into our psyche in some way as actual physical things that's what tulpas are there is some research on this and a lot of anecdotal stuff you can find out there that claims that it is possible for thoughts to create actual physical forms even bodies and beings that come in the form of uh, well you might I guess like make a mental projection of a little butler guy that you want to have come clean up your house for you. I don't know. I wouldn't use it that way. I guess it would be like a Mr. Meeseeks if you're a Rick and Morty fan. <laughs> the way I understand it is it's all part of self. Every mental projection, every physical object out there in the outer world is actually all psyche. Inner and outer worlds are actually psyche. That's one of the things that I appreciated a lot about checking out Michael's work and talking to him is the philosophy of non-dualism, realizing that those inner and outer worlds are not separate. And in the plus extension, which you can access at patreon.com forward slash interverse, or you can also just check the links in the episode notes. We talked about philosophy of non-dualism quite a bit to kick off the plus extension. And Also, to go into this idea of thoughts kind of creating the physical reality, the idealism thing, that made us get into a conversation about the future of the human body and the potential for super heroic, superhuman abilities. I'm not, see, I'm not very interested in this sort of like cybernetic man 2.0 type of future where we merge with machines and AI and somehow attain like immortality or godhood. To me, that's danger. danger zone like to, uh, i'm more interested in guys like wim hoff which we did touch on in the plus extension you should definitely check out that guy dude who's got literal superpowers that pretty much come through him knowing himself and knowing his breath and you know, destroying his own fear and <laughs> tapping into the huge potential that our bodies have our bodies are reservoirs uh not reservoirs generators of bio energy and that bioenergy is also the stuff that creates the entire universe that's what makes the sun burn that's what makes evolution proceed it it's all a spark of bioenergy that's in every form and that's why you really can't destroy magic in actually you're not even you know we think of ourselves as these like bicameral divided beings uh or at least philosophers do where we have this inner world and outer world or conscious and unconscious and uh, us and them or other and self all of that is really all a mental construct just like i guess everything else in the universe is at its core like mystics and quantum physicists would say like our entire relationship to the universe is through our way of seeing our that's all we get (laughs) our way of seeing tells us everything about what we think we know so I guess I guess that's why philosophy of self-knowledge is so important because the collective beliefs that the social ego create for us are what toxify our potential and therefore our environment. It comes out in all this violence that we do against ourselves and the world. It's from this sort of thinking we need to please the other type of mentality that lets us go along with the herd or do what's safe because everyone else is doing it when in reality everyone else is doing it kind of as an extension of the same reason you're doing it which is that you aren't wanting to be responsible for yourself so or you know be even free and that's another big topic is like how how we even kind of embrace our our lack of freedom we 
you know, we submit it to authority so that we don't have to be responsible for it. But we're not the same person every day, and we shouldn't think that going along with the crowd every day is going to be somehow safety. And like I was saying, it toxifies the environment, obviously, <laughs> what we're doing by not being self-directed. And anyway, I guess that's maybe a little bit more of a, a rant than you guys needed. <laughs> but I just to, I have a lot more thoughts about this and hopefully I'll get it all sorted out. I'll tell you more about the plus extension though. I'll just tell you all kinds of stuff that we talked about in the plus extension. It won't give anything away. But we, we got into the 11 other senses beyond the five that are commonly accepted. We defined this term uh, Anatiodromia, I think that's how you pronounce it. Anatiodromia. It's the tendency of things to change into their opposites, especially as a supposed governing principle of natural cycles and of psychological development. So that's interesting. Michael gave his list of cool dinosaurs to look out for in the new Jurassic Park movie and his thoughts on what humanity has to gain by studying our ancient antecedents. We talked about enlightenment and maintaining scientific and spiritual doubt about what we think we know in order to stay on the track of evolution. And yeah, that's a complex subject in itself, but it does to me, like to get on another sidetrack to me, in light, in mint, it's like in light, inward light, in mint, which is mind. So enlightenment, the word is literally telling you it's the light of the light generated from within yourself. That is what creates this harmony and this sort of peace or it's not an ultimate final destination this idea of enlightenment either i think that's a religious jive that we got to drop enlightenment is just that being having your course lit by your own inner lantern or whatever you're you know getting by on your own bioenergy and your own relationship to nature and not maintaining this type of dependency on things outside of the self artificial things i should say and realizing that nature is self but this malignant culture that destroys nature so so readily that's not exactly the self right that's that's the alien what what is this alien predatory thing in our consciousness where where is it coming from i think it's this idea of the superego uh, in the i guess freudian terms or jungian terms i think it's freud right superego superego is your social ego it's the self that you construct as sort of a mask to please and get those cues and affectations from other people that fuel you and so you know one thing we talked about more in the plus extension was about the body and about practices of enhancing one's sensitivity to what your inner world is actually feeling your physical body and so back to the idea of you know super ego versus ego I'm starting to think the ego and the body are like the same thing. The the skin of the body is the skin of this ego. And it's only when it's acting out, when the body or the ego is acting out the super ego's game, that's when, you know, we're playing Monopoly and we're taking each other's uh, houses and hotels or charging each other money, all this like sort of game of, of conquest. And... The actual ego, its relationship to nature, the the physical body that is, when I say ego, is to find some sort of niche and balance within that niche. That's the where ancestors would have been doing it. And yeah, we talked a lot about dinosaurs and how our ancient ancestors can inform us about our current evolution. (laughs) Okay, I'll get back on track and tell you more about the plus extension. I'm feeling a little ranty today. We talked about synesthesia of time, which is something I guess Michael experiences, and maybe I can kind of relate to it in my own way. But the wheel of the year, it keeps, you know, keeping track of what you do from day to day and then looking back on that. You can find some really strange temporal synchronicities. An example would be if your Facebook memories that come up on Facebook tell you that one year ago or five years ago this day, you're thinking something that's right along the same lines as right now, or you're hanging out with the same person that day. You know, these kind of things are actually quite common. It's it's a strange loop that we're in. <laughs> yeah. Something else that we've talked about, and this is going to be a direct quote from Michael here, which I think is just so spot on, but you should hear you know, the rest of it in context by signing up for Plus, is that 
even if you think you don't have some sort of belief framework that guides the way you live your life, you're going to find that invisible framework by looking at the problems that you keep running into over and over again and the assumptions you're bringing to these situations. And wow, I know you guys that are plus subscribers that are hearing the same outro as the free people are like, man, I just heard all this. But you are, you're getting my thoughts on it too. <laughs> I think these nested levels of belief, that's what we should really be looking at as our inner verse or our inner world. It's, okay, what, what do I think? And then why do I think what I think? And then getting to the, the why behind the why. And it's just like, it's turtles all the way down, as they say. <laughs> There's, it's, a, it's an interesting fractal experience to be able to sort of map out how your belief structures are actually creating your reality. And that's something that I'm going to get into a lot more in the next episode with uh, an author named Renee Johanna, which is going to be really cool. I've already got that one in the bag. <laughs> Another thing we talked about, the last thing I'll tell you about is... Have you ever heard of the term homunculus? It's like an alchemy term from the Middle Ages originally, but it's the idea that there was that you could get a little grow a little man in a jar, and he would be like you'd be like his god, and you can somehow benefit from that. And then the idea also maybe pertains to the that some medieval scholars perhaps thought that there was a little miniature man inside of our heads that ran everything we we're doing, and <laughs> I think that's kind of funny too. Because if you now what we know is the inside of our head is actually more like a giant universe, literally. If you look at scans of the or like photography of the larger universe as we're able to blow it up, it looks a lot like neural pathway networks and how all that circuitry in our heads actually fits together. And so what you could say that's like governing your head is actually the universe or nature, as opposed to some little miniaturized copy of man and I think even the idea that humans used to think that there could have been a little miniature person inside the head governing everything that the person does that is like the super ego right that's like your little master that's the extension of your parental authorities or societal authorities that were basically controlling you whenever you had no choice because you were younger <laughs> I'd love to get more into it into the psychology stuff and so as i research it i probably will be talking about it more on the show so that'll be fun but i guess with that i'll, I'll stop there i could tell you more about the plus extension but i've been going on and on and i do want you to actually check it out but trust me in context all the stuff i just explained is way cooler speaking of my wonderful patreon interverse plus subscribers it's been a while since I actually did the shout outs that I owe. I apologize for that. I kind of slept on some of the Patreon duties because I, I didn't have it set up in an intelligent way. But you guys should know, it's uh, the reward structure is revised and I've got a more strategic plan to actually implement all the rewards in the best way possible for you guys. I'm trying. <laughs> As Michael said at one point, uh, I guess this was in the plus extension too. You don't want to just sort of like quit your job out of nowhere and try to get by just on your own creativity. And I agree with that. That's why I haven't just dropped my day job because I feel that nature likes to move things in smooth transitions. And if you guys subscribe to my Patreon, you'll be assisting me doing this smooth transition out of being a cubicle zombie most of my day to being a full-time podcaster and researcher of the self and even greater than that i would have time to do a lot more art <laughs> and that could be cool for you you guys too maybe it turn into neato shirts and posters and things that you can actually get your hands on so the patreon patron shout outs that are owed nicholas heilig who is also a past guest of the show definitely recommend you go check out his episode with me and another good one to be on plus for because as I recall, we get even more in kind of intricate in that episode than any other about what the life of a life painter is like. You know, we only touched on that a little bit at the beginning with Michael here. Also want to thank new patron Jose Quijada. Quijada. I'm sorry, I think I said it wrong the first time. Quijada. I, 
It's been a long time since I was in Spanish. I did look up a pronunciation for that to make sure I got it right, but it's been several minutes ago. Hopefully that was right. Thank you so much for subscribing, man. I hope that you're getting the most out of it and that it is, you know, beneficial to you in some way, to your happiness or your self-knowledge. And also, Karen Lee, thank you for your continued patronage. A huge supporter, Karen Lee, has put in quite a few of those digital shekels to help keep this show rolling and I owe you a t-shirt and guess what it's in the mail on the way as of today I finally got it out there and yeah there's also there's a tier on patreon guys where you can get a t-shirt so that's kind of cool right you can also buy a t-shirt off my website for 25 bucks but if you subscribe on patreon it's only 25 bucks for the tier where you get a t-shirt uh, I say only 25 bucks that's an amazing monthly donation but remember, with Patreon, you could do one month at a certain tier and then bump your donation down to another lower level. If you know, it'd blow my mind if somebody signed up for $100 a month, but I would think maybe they're just going to do that one month. <laughs> anyway, uh, do, do what's best for you, you know. And if what's best for you is to listen to the free show, I respect that. And that's why I make sure there is a free show that's at least an hour. And I love you guys. Okay. So, also, like Michael Garfield said at the beginning out, or at the end of the episode there, I have a strong desire to hear back from you listeners. So, if you don't want to subscribe on Patreon, but you do want to make me happy in a way that's free, why not comment on something somewhere, send me a message or an email? You know, I don't care. Actually, one thing that would be great, that would be extra helpful, I guess, is if you left a five-star review on iTunes. And if you do that and actually write something... I'll read that on the show, whether it's nice or mean, and I'll be happy. So <laughs> that's something you could do or um, just silently work on yourself, and I appreciate that as well. But any connections I get from y'all make me feel less like I'm just sitting in an empty room talking to myself. <laughs> I guess there's my uh, my little critter friends in here. You know what I realized today? Just a total tangent. But animal the word animal actually means uh, etymologically bad spirit you have animus which is like spirit anima and then you have mal which is bad mal mal animal bad spirit uh that doesn't really compute to me so i'm going to call them critters or some such thing little spirits um good spirits and a bueno i don't know but seriously, it's far out how, like I was bringing up, these nested belief frameworks that are invisible to us, language is a big one. And just the very fact that we go around calling animals bad spirits, are, consciously we're not aware of that. I didn't realize it till today. But unconsciously, of course you know that. I mean, it's not like my unconscious didn't know what those two root words meant. I did. It just was like bringing it to the light of my mind is what made me realize, oh, this whole time I've been calling these little beautiful relatives of mine <laughs> bad spirits. So take that for what you will. Maybe you'll keep using the word animal to describe them. Maybe not. Maybe we'll come up with a better word collectively. But English is weird. So I'm going to stop speaking English and go do something else. Uh, like finish up and post this episode. It's been a really fun one to edit. And thanks for letting me talk to you here in the outro a little bit. I think I'm going to do more of this type of thing where I ramble at you. Hope you don't mind. Like I said, you can hit me up and let me know and I'll be pleased that I had contact with a real human. And remember, Michael would also like to hear from you. And I'm sure you'd enjoy his podcast, Future Fossils. Especially if you like this one. So make sure you show him some love too. I'm so happy you came on the show. Couldn't have been more appreciative. Well, I guess I probably could always be more appreciative. But I felt super appreciative because I had such a good time. Thanks, Michael. Hope to talk to you again. Okay. Thanks for listening to the show. Remember, you can subscribe at patreon.com forward slash universe plus extensions. And may the force be with you always. I love you all. Peace.